before I start talking, uh, raise of hands of uh, uh, who are engineers in here in the crowd? Okay, awesome. Uh, followed by um, people with finance background or finance um, degrees or roles. Awesome. Uh, marketing and sales. Marketing, sales. Pretty good mix. Uh, lucky pricing managers here? <laughs> Obviously, you won't be here then. <laughs> Dumb question. Not a good start. Uh, so finally, product managers. A good mix. So, so this kind of helps me to get an understanding of uh, where I should be uh, with this. So uh, a little bit about my background so that you guys at least start trusting me uh, on what I'm going to talk. Uh, spend uh, th four years in semiconductor industry uh, doing embedded pricing for Fortune 500 company. Uh, followed that with uh, pricing strategy at EY for about a year and a half and then did uh, same uh, leading pricing product management for AWS. Uh, more recently, I moved to Alexa because uh, uh, there's where the fun is. Um, so today's topic would be more around understanding why pricing uh, is needed and why it is important for us. Why are we even here? Uh, it's a product school, right? Uh, why am I here, right? So let's let's start, uh, jump right in. Uh, so today's agenda, I'll start with uh, comprehensive pricing, 10 minutes. Uh, then go through some of the pricing types, uh, not an exhaustive list, but some of the top five um, type of pricing types you would see out there. Uh, then talk about importance of price communication and wrap it up with uh, a fun interactive pricing exercise, right? Uh, so next slide, uh, I've attempted to give a one page on everything you need to know to get a right price. I guess, sorry, that's a smart move, right? <laughs> uh, so what I can say, like, you will walk out of any conversation around pricing with a lot of these different things and everybody coming from different directions uh, trying to make sense out of your pricing, right? And then everybody, like people from sales would have, uh, you know, sales and revenue numbers uh, to talk about why the pricing should be low or where it should be. Uh, engineers and product managers, they want to mark their prices very high because they feel they have made the best product possible. Finance guys are, are fighting. I want my margins. Where are those margins at? So everybody's pulling in. Marketing guys are like, hey, give me more money to spend on brand enhancement and all that stuff, right? So I'm pretty sure I've kind of like tickled everybody here. And uh, now we are talking some interesting topics. Like, so nobody can actually tell you the right price. Uh, sorry, like that's the bad news. But then the whole presentation from here would talk what we should do, what we can do to come to the best guess or best attempt at pricing our product, right? So let's move on. Uh, why is pricing uh, important? Why not any other thing in our organization? Why is it so important? Uh, so a lot of data has been ran uh, with a lot of organization who have uh, probably reached maturity or who have done a lot of businesses. Um, the following is an average of what we have found. If you can increase your pricing by 1% or your price by 1%, the average net profit growth you see 11%. Compared to that, only 6% increase is seen if you improve your cost or cost of goods sold or if you work really hard towards uh, making your, your processes efficient and everything, you'll see an average 4% increase in your net profit margin. So now that gives me, as a product manager, if your boss comes to you and he gives you two projects, one improves the entire process efficiency of your pipeline. And then there's this other guy who's talking about, hey, this is gonna just improve your pricing by 1%. Pick the right project for your next promotion. <coughs> so that's where you need to place yourself. So that's why pricing is important. Uh, just not for, so it, it talks about top line, but it translates into a very effective, very huge <coughs> bottom line growth. So that's where we are at, right? That's why we are talking pricing. Let's go. So now I'm going to talk uh, about comprehensive pricing. So pricing can also be thought of as uh, a traditional product management. Uh, what do I mean by that? Usually, I've seen product managers thinking about pricing as, hey, this is my product. This is awesome. Let's price this at $100. Right, that's what, what pricing 
a naive world stands for. But in, in reality, people who have been part of uh, a lot of the business side when it comes to you know marketing sales or actual project pricing manager or even the real product managers who have been doing pricing, they realize there is a whole lot more to it, right? And uh, what this framework kind of shows is what, what a product manager has to be cognizant of before they are doing their pricing and how effectively and efficiently they can create a product and the pricing practice around their entire product life cycle. So just to give you an example, uh, when you think about a product, you think about, hey, there is this vision you create, and then you break down that vision. And then you come up with a minimal viable product. And then what you do is like you launch. After you launch, you, mar you, you try to figure out the success metrics to that. And then you try to measure whether your launch product is performing against it or not. And then you collect the feedback and use that feedback for your next launch or products or current product improvement. So what, you, what we'll see next through these different slides as we dive deep into each of these is pricing is no different. It has to go hand in hand with your product definition. Let's move on. So let's dive deep into pricing strategy and goals. So a lot of times when uh, a product is kind of created, uh, it, generally uh, the product manager tries to align their product with what the corporate goal is. Uh, but then a lot of that goes missing when you're trying to create a pricing goal. Um, for, big, for startups, it's very easy for a product manager to align with the CEO because he has that great visibility in what's going on, where, where they want to take their startup to. But then in a bigger firms, uh, product managers are left in lurch and they do not have that visibility on what their corporate goals are. Now, instead of throwing these big names uh, or, or words, I'll try to give an example. Uh, assuming there's a product manager sitting in Apple, and we all know, like, as soon as we talk Apple, we, what, what are we thinking already? Premium, consumer electronic goods, right? Uh, delights customer, and uh, price real heavy. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody from Apple, hopefully, but it doesn't matter, right? I mean, everybody pays for the premium and the experience they get. Uh, think about a product manager He's, he understands that goal, and what if he comes up with, um, I don't know, like a, a touch flip phone? Three billion people out there who would buy that. There is a huge market in many, many different countries, right? There's a price point he can put, which is real cheap, real good, with probably the technology which was used for iPhone 1, and have a great product out there for three billion people. That's probably twice the current user data user base of Apple. But is he aligning his product to the corporate goal? The answer is no. The pricing of that has to be under 100 bucks. Does the pricing goal align with the corporate, pro, uh, corporate goals? No. The day he presents this might be the, his last day at the conference. <laughs> so, so you got to start thinking that let me have that conversation with my management or my senior leaders to understand what the corporate goal is. So that's where very important. Now, converting those goals into actual strategies. How do you kind of think about those strategies now? Now, if you have understood where my corporate goal lies, there are four questions you want to answer. Who are my customers for this current product, right? They could be same as what your company has or might be different with this product you're trying to launch. So you got to be really crisp about defining uh, the segment of customer you're looking. What is the value you're trying to provide with your product? And then what are the problems your actual customer have? So though, both, both things, like a lot of times you feel that you're going to answer every problem they have, but then there is the other side to it, which is like, can I do everything what they want? No, I'm sorry, I cannot help Mike with every problem he has, right? So that's, that's where we are, and always keeping co competition in mind. So your strategy is kind of form out a goal uh, from the goals. It's like, okay, I'm going to serve this market. I'm going to 
provide them with these little features or these little problems I'll solve with my next generation or my current enhancements. And that's, that's already kind of dictating where your pricing is gonna start. Then you start thinking, okay, when I'm talking this kind of product, I'm trying to be in this price range. So you see how your product strategy kind of also ties to your pricing strategy. And then if you have defined a product which gives you a price range of, uh, say, $1,000 for that phone, now you start thinking, can we execute on this? So that's where a pricing vision and a product vision has to align. You, you thought about a product, but can the market support the pricing vision for that as well? Does that make sense? Let's move on. Moving on uh, to architecture and implementation. So price architecture is more about how do you set that initial price. So initial price is the list price. We'll get into different verb, uh, different terminologies uh, used for price, but this is like the retail price for the consumer goods. Or uh, we have to when we are thinking about pricing, you also kind of want to think about any kind of products, a SaaS <laughs> service offering, or any kind of like product and service combination offering, right? So the architecture basically talks about uh, things like for say SaaS offering, uh, it's dollar per person per month, dollar per unit of time, per unit of unit usage, uh, and, and et cetera, right? So that's kind of architecture, how you kind of come up to that piece. Um, a good architecture of pricing and needs a very good understanding of cost. So we'll talk about a lot of the models where it will, it will seem that you don't need to have understanding of cost, but having your cost done helps a lot of the analysis. So let's dive a little bit deeper to understand what is the problem with cost when we're thinking about pricing. During my consulting, I consulted with a lot of Fortune 100 companies, and one thing which was consistently missing in many top firms as well is the accurate understanding of their cost. And now you would say, hey, when I'm trying to like start a new startup and I don't even know what my sales are gonna be or where my cost is gonna be, how do I kind of think about it, right? So there's a lot of that done by a lot of projection and best estimation analysis or where your product is gonna be, right? So a lot of us through other courses have learned how do we do that projections uh, and, and realistic projections, right? So one of the ways to uh, think about right set of uh, cost uh, is the first aspect, which kind of everybody gets right, that, okay, you can s track all your material invoices, track all, your, uh, all the HR expense for your every employee. So you have a very good understanding of how much did you spend in terms of that R&D and the product development piece. If your projections are uh, 100,000 unit, and if you are gonna spend about uh, 100 million, you know where we are landing with that cost, right? One thing which consistently goes missing is the bottom three, uh, three or four parts. So that is that includes like an intangible part to your, uh, it's an intangible cost to your product. People don't realize that there has been, there or there will be a significant effort for marketing and putting those ads out there on Facebook and getting that eyes and pops and whatnot, you know, like different clicks, click through rates and whatnot. Uh, so that kind of cost something, right? People miss out on that. Un understanding where your customer service is, like a lot of the SaaS solutions, uh, like, you know, CRMs and all that, they cost uh, a lot of CSRs, customer service hours, where there are TAMs on the field uh, and uh, other field engineers they are used for deployment, and a lot of times that those hours are given for free. Again, customer service calls, depending on how big your clients are, those those costs are are very rarely taken into account when you are creating your initial price. That's where a product manager he needs to understand that when he's building that product, how much of these other things what is uh, what what his product need. If you are in a very simple uh, plug and play then probably not so much. But if you're talking an implementation like Salesforce.com, SAP or something like that, a lot of this, right? 
And then you gotta understand how do you kind of account that for for that in your unit revenue. So you, have, you so this is a process of pricing architecture where you get a very solid understanding of your cost, and then basically come up with a pricing strategy for that or pricing architecture for that. Um, and a lot of that would be like I'll tie that when we talk about different types of pricing. Moving real quickly to pricing implementation. So pricing implementation is how you kind of communicate the logic, the feature set, uh, to your internal org so that they are on board. Like finance has to agree that, okay, I'm going to only give you 5% for this product. Oh my God, you're making my life up. Right? And sales, or vice versa, right? Like if you go to sales, hey, this is why we expect 40% margin. And, and you, you will have really hard time selling this because this is very high premium product. So you gotta tell different value propositions, features, why is it better than competitors and all that. So there has to be that product manager who can understand, who, who, does, who not only makes a very good product, but he can actually put into words why he made that and what's the value proposition for its customer and why should they should pay this price. So that's where the implementation aspects comes into the picture, right? So now, what do we need to kind of enable all this? Pricing analytics. So this, is, this again ties back to, you know, like you've launched your product after initial price setting. How's, it, how's my product doing, right? So this is where, we, where it kind of starts coming. So the first aspect of effective de data analytics um, and tracking the value. So there are like a lot of tools which kind of helps you gather that market analytics uh, to combine into your product, right? But, and that's during your initial phase. So, hey, how is market, uh, how is market pricing their SaaS model? So if the market is doing dollar per person per year, can we start going and offering one price forever? That kind of information needs to be extracted. What are the different pricing models? What are people doing? Uh, you know, like, what are different price changes uh, my competitors are offering? What are different um, similar products doing in the market? That's where an effective analytics comes into picture. Similarly, uh, those analytics uh, needs to now convert into dashboard and tracking me mechanism to understand how does your different segment or feature or product are getting reactions. Like, there could be different geos, which is a more price sensitive versus the other who like your pricing and they are like buying it, right? So, so a good analytics dashboard or success metrics would first understand that and try to give a feedback. Then you can have price discrimination based on uh, by customer, by customer region, or both, or a mixture of both, right? So that's where a very sophisticated model start come playing in. Uh, then some of the things which uh, a, a nice pricing organization need to track is um, price waterfall. We'll talk about that right here. So this is what, what I call a price waterfall. Uh, what does that mean? A price waterfall starts with list price. That's like your initial price. That's where we are at. <coughs> and then, uh, see one thing, there's no cost out there till a little later, right? Uh, right around that pocket margin. Then you would see, what is this? You know, like as a product manager, I was thinking like there's cost, and then there's this price, but then my value of my product, which I'm pocketing, is going down. So basically this increases, this shows that that's, this is where you priced your product at uh, per unit, and this is what you end up getting. So pocket margin is basically the margin you end up pocketing with this product. So what's going on? Let's, let's go through a little bit of that. Uh, so a lot of here is what uh, marketing and sales are trying to play with to actually get that product sold. Our fund product managers uh, marked it at $100 per person per month. Man, market is sitting at 45 right? Our finance guys are like, no, there's no way I'm going to go below 60 So that kind of thing happens, right? And, and so if you see, there's like a lot of these discounts, like so program discounts for for different kind of regions and strategic programs, volume discounts for your big enterprise customers. Uh, if you're selling international, there are like a lot of FX adjustments and kicks you have to take. Now the actual buy price. So they are coming to the buying price. So there are a lot of other discounts like 
if you bought through certain channel discount, uh, other promotions during, if you want to push a product out, different pro you're sitting in a different life cycle of the product and you want to push those out. Uh, so a lot of that kind of comes into picture right here. Now you sold the product. Let's, let's get that shipped. So all that kind of comes here. So actual, actual logistics, invoice. And then there are other discounts with like what delivery timing is given for these products. So those are other discounts. And finally you take off all your cost of material, sales costs and everything to finally come up to pocket margin. So if you're a product manager sitting with just a cost figure and thinking that, okay, let me charge 20% over what, I, what my cost figures are, that is the stack you're missing. Right? So you got to start thinking about the stack. Get this data. There are people out there, the stand, uh, industry standards, if you are a startup, where, are, where is everybody landing? So data is the king. Analytics is going to help you. And guess what? There are pricing tools and software for that. So a smart data analytics, competitive intelligence tracking, and margin analysis is very necessary. In this graph, uh, when you do margin analysis at every point, it is very e easy to figure out where is the highest cost you're losing out of this. So a lot of times what will happen is uh, you might have a very shitty cost of material compared to industry, or your logistics is not too good, or you're giving too, m too much uh, discount up front to just to be in market. Probably your sales guys are not that good. I mean, you gotta look at your bonus plans a little bit, right? So, so that's giving you a high, uh, like high level understanding of, that's what we call price leakage. So you thought it should be right here based on all your research. Where is the leakage happening? And if you have a very good software good tool to track it, that's where you will get the right data. You will be able to pinpoint that when our competitors, when Samsung can do it for this much, why can't we? Sitting at Apple. Uh, so another couple of things, uh, one good to do it, uh, code invoices, uh, pricing software, which kind of helps you uh, do that code negotiation with your, uh, uh, with your um, customer or partner, OEMs, ODMs, or direct partners. And then con configure price code is um, a very sophisticated solution generally used by complex enterprise uh, or SaaS solutions. When you have multiple different things you're selling, you have a huge product portfolio, and your customers want very specific things uh, according to their needs. So you basically configure your your offering, price it based on their requirement and the time of delivery and everything, and then you send the code. So that's 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 something that I wanted to tell a lot of people who work in B2B or thinking of like getting to uh, a SaaS market, basically a lot of like Cisco's and Salesforce, SAP, and many other companies, they, you gotta like understand these two. Uh, pros, Vendavo, Zillion, they are basically uh, Salesforce.coms of the pricing world, very big software. Not endorsing any of them, but they are the folks out there, just in case. Yeah. Um, very briefly touching, like, after, so usually most of the organization, product managers are responsible for price setting. So huge onus on us. So if things messes up, damn, <clears throat> you know who's, who's uh, on the line of fire, right? But then the execution of uh, pricing, by execution I mean who is on the road doing the real negotiation and everything, that's done by two or three layers of pricing managers. So why is this important? Because if you want to become a product manager to a principal and then become a GM in a big firm, you have to understand profit and loss statement. You have to have that control. And if you don't, if you just get, like, if you're just happy about setting a price and, hey, throwing it off uh, on the other side of the wall, you're never gonna get there. You have to understand what happened there. Whether we are spending a marketing budget, where we're in price leakages, what is my business doing? GM is pretty much the CEO of that product line. He's just not making features. He's actually delivering bottom line profit. So that's, that's where a, a very solid organization uh, of like different levels of uh, communication, different level of price negotiation, and things like that comes. Uh, why we need tiered, tiered organization? You want to make sure your top guys only get to talk to tier one deals. 
and, and so and so forth, right? So that's what it is. Um, let's move forward. So jumping in, type of pricing strategies. So I'm going to talk like so five top pricing strategies uh, used in different industries. So you'll get a different flavor of why I'm talking about one versus the other, what we should be thinking when we are launching one product versus the other type. Uh, this is a mixed room, so um, yeah, like everybody can get something out of it. Uh, so pricing that makes sense for your customer <coughs> and your product, right? So before we jump into uh, different, pro uh, different pricing models or types, uh, I, wanna uh, I want you guys to see what this is. So basically what I've tried to map is profit and sales for your product has a cyclical effect. As a GM or a product owner, you want to always measure where your profit stands, right? Or how your product is doing. So it kind of aligns with your product life cycle as well. So there's a product development phase where, uh, on your left right here, where you're just throwing money at it. Then you launch with an MVP, start making some money, but not profit. You're still putting a lot of money because there is some traction now, right? Okay, this thing works. People at least are talking about it, right? And then you start seeing growth. And it's during growth you see a very high margin. So one interesting thing to note is this point at the growth. You are still not sitting at the peak of your sales. But you, if you see your profit has almost reached the peak. What does that mean? Is like the excitement in the market has taken. And now, you know, like people have accepted this. But guess what? You are very soon, if you're a smart product manager who is to, who's still thinking about what to do next, you are probably thinking about next product because this is inevitable. Your sales will keep rising, but the way it is happening is by more discount, more, uh, more, you know, like marketing spend. You know, so your your gap between actual profit margin and your product sales that's widening. So if you are a smart product manager, you will anticipate that, and your product roadmap should look for version two. Parallel market, parallel segment, different country expansion, all these different strategies where your pricing and product can still stick, right? So that's what you're looking. So with this in mind, really want to talk about one line if you want to take out of this slide is a, su a, a successful product manager would be able to transition from one pricing model at point X to a different pricing model on the, when, when you're at a different part of your product cycle journey, right? Like if your product is mature, have a very successful transition. We'll keep your customer guessing and we'll keep your, uh, sorry, we'll keep your customer interested and we'll keep your competitors guessing, right? They are not able to follow you there. What the hell is going on? Let's get into the uh, cost per pricing. Um, one of the simplest form of pricing, it's basically cost, add a markup, and there's your price, right? Um, a lot of people think uh, about their pricing like that. Probably the worst possible pricing to do. Um, and uh, you know, like let's let's just explain for people uh, who don't know the terminology. The way it works is uh, you you try to get a good understanding for your cost, the so cost of material, cost of labor, and every overhead which we kind of talked about to get a total cost. And then you you're talking. Okay, I see my competitors making twenty percent, or I think if I make twenty percent, I should be happy with it. Uh, that's what I need to survive. Let's get that going, right? So that's that's cost plus. Like, I mean, simple Excel, not even the second tab, and you got your price. <laughs> so very easy, right? Like we are rocking already. So that's what you're pricing. Again, is it that bad? I mean, made it sound simple. No, probably not. Like, this is still used in many mature industry, right? Like probably insurance, where everybody's cutting throat. You know, so how do you effectively, or who, do, who, do, who, who can even use this, uh, this kind of pricing strategy? A, a competitive advantage is gained in this scenario in two ways. One is if you can provide somehow more value or more feature, right, at the same price, right, or lesser price, right? So that's a competitive advantage in a very stable industry. You have shaken something, right? I, I give examples of benefits. Like, uh, 
HR software company, giving the HR software for free. I mean, they have caused a lot of shakes out there. Um, how are they making money? They're trying to sell insurance at a premium on their platform. Amazing business model. That's a competitive advantage or extra feature for same or zero value, zero dollars, right? Let's go next. Uh, or you can somehow find a cheaper way to make same product. Engineered word, now there is laminate. Same look, same everything, $5 less per square feet. Hey, I'm buying that. Right, so that's what cheaper lo uh, labor, easier to fit, less raw material. So this mechanism or this pricing is still not dead. It's still out there. Every everything we see around us is mature. So there is a lot of chance of improving this. And if you can improve this, this will still be a great method to price. I see we are, a lot of us are in technology industry, so probably not so much for a tech product, right? So let's get moving, probably getting young already. Uh, a, a total opposite of, of cost plus pricing is price skimming. So basically, price skimming is, is, has been used very effectively by consumer electronic products, especially when they're innovating. And generally, they start at anywhere between uh, 500 to, I, I don't know, like even, yeah, 500 to like 5,000% 5, growth. So basically what they're trying to sell, luxury. Just not value, just super luxury, right? Uh, who are they trying to target? Or why, why are they first of all doing it, right? They want to recoup the cost of their investment as soon as possible. So if you are in one of those innovative, uh, very rapidly growing industry where there is more innovation, this is, which is, this is one of the pricing strategies which is very effective. You know, all you need to break even is probably 1% of your TAM, total addressable market, you know? So if you can understand your segment well, <coughs> and you can address the pricing based on that, that'd be great. Now who is your segment in this? So if you guys understand uh, the adoption curve of people, uh, of humanity, uh, it starts with innovators, early adopters, early majority, late adopters, uh, laggards, and I don't care about who the hell you are. So that's like the last 3% of, of the population. And the first three, basically, 3% 3 for, uh, for innovators, 20-ish and 34 for early adopters and early majority, right? So that gives you close to 50% of your population. This talks about the first 20 to 30 percent people in that first population group. If I can get them excited about this, this is a luxury thing. It has got nothing to do with the actual dollar spent in making that product. So people who outweigh the need for need uh, of having their product outweighs their need for economizing on that category. That's where this pricing is very effective. And then as soon as we kind of recoup that. We want to take the take the price down, and you know, voila, just phase out the product. A very good example on this slide is iPhone. Again, not trying to haze <laughs> Apple right there, but that's where that's that's what Apple has done very effectively with every product since its inception, and that's that's a customer experience. That's something we all love. That's why we have that. So that's that's a very good example. Now, a, a total opposite strategy, I wouldn't say total, but kind of opposite strategy, is penetration pricing. And that's generally done to penetrate into the market. Skimming didn't care about getting more people, uh, you know, like excited. But penetration talks all about, I want more. I want everybody. And I'm going to just charge a cent a, p a person and going to be a trillionaire or something. So that's what penetration pricing is. So basically, it starts real low get everything excited, get people to talk about it, get them interested, get them talking. And so if you are in the industry where uh, you're making you know, like some kind of app or some kind of value-added software, you start with a very low and then once people adopt it, they just can't live without it, you start flipping a little, like you start charging a little bit more and more as you provide more value, as you have more people who talk about you and things like that. Um, why is this used? It, it, it looks to create a lot of goodwill 
or generate that self social mar media marketing kind of a, a deal within itself based on its pricing. Hey, did you try that app? It's a couple of bucks. It gets the perfect selfie and I can also like upload to Snapchat right away. <laughs> right? I mean, it's $2. What else do you want? And then this throw in five more filters for five bucks in a year. I'm sucked into that already, right? So that kind of like strategy is, is this. Um, again, what it does in some of the niche market, it scares off your com competitors. That's very important. If you, your product has low barrier to entry, and I mean, I under, like we all talk about that when we design our product, right? Barriers to entry. If your product has low barrier to entry, you want competitors to be scared of you rather than, oh, come on, we defined this product segment for you and let's come and take my market share. So that's, that is very important. Like that's, this is one of the strategies when you're thinking when the low, barrier to entry is low and anybody can enter and you are trying to like scare them with either your goodwill, low pricing, or ability to serve, right? You gotta make sure that as a company who is implementing that, your cost of operations are low because you're almost giving it for at, at a negative margin pretty much, right? Another problem with that is if, you're, if you only end up getting, you know, like people who are really cheap or people who don't, who want your service for free, they might start dropping off when you increase prices because that's what you're trying to do. So in this graph, I basically try to like uh, show a different type of pricing and what they're doing. So price scaling starts real crazy high up there, probably for same price, uh, same cost of implementation. And then it tries to like get all this uh, margin and, and recoup all the investment right here and then go down in its value. Versus penetration has a, an opposite strategy. So again, two different industries we talked about, two different kind of mentality and thought process, right? Uh, let's move on to freemium pricing, my favorite type of pricing, right? Uh, again, I think everybody kind of knows about it, uh, what freemium means, start with free and then uh, do something with it or try to uh, get money out of a different channel. Like Google is a great example, you give your search for free, but then I sell you ads. Facebook, I take all your data and sell it to people. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so that's this where I'm at uh, with the premium. Uh, there are many different ways uh, I've seen this being executed for different B2B and B2C customers. Uh, one of, like, so, so some of the limitations, like some of the implementation are giving limited feature for free and ask them to upgrade as they want more value or give them limited capacity for cloud and all that, limited use of time, or limited support from your, your staff. Uh, want to touch briefly, I am a big fan of uh, limited use of time. Uh, I love the Salesforce model that you can use my, I have four tiers of offering, right? You can take my best tier offering like everything, all the guns, with all the guns and vessels, implement that, use it for two months, three months, whatnot, and then I charge you what I told you I will charge, right? So, I mean, that kind of gets people interested. You, you, you filter out people who will just use you for a little bit and you're supporting and there's a whole lot of cost going in. I mean, that's what I'm a fan of, but then different things make sense for different businesses, right? Um, like customer, like LinkedIn, for that matter, which is a limited feature uh, implementation, uh, that's a great strategy for them, right? They earn a ton of money through their ads, through, their, uh, through the uh, hiring recruiters, right? When other people are just around in the community and the network is growing. So, so they try to uh, get monetization through the recruiter, like a different community is paying for the rest half of their community. So there is no one right answer, right? There are different things you want to break down and, and understand. Who is actually going to give me, give me money? What is the value proposition I'm giving for my customer, right? And also want to, free, want to just remove people who does not give you any kind of monetization advantage. I've seen that, lot, that being done in a lot of companies. Uh, Best Buy was one of the big examples of that where uh, they started moving, so they, they 
they were becoming a showrooming thing. People went there, click, okay, find it at uh, everythingelse.com or cheapelectronics.com. Thanks, thanks Best Buy for the experience. So they are trying to like filter out uh, a lot of the product SKUs they kind of get, which is only in Best Buy, or SKUs which are generally for premium buy and things like that. So that's, that's a very good strategy. Again, this is uh, ideal for startup. This is uh, especially for software company to get a lot of traction among this customer segment they are targeting. And uh, you know, it's easy to communicate your value proposition. They can try everything, they can see everything, and if they like it, they stick or they don't. So that's, this is a very effective model. Now we talk about value-based pricing. This is one of the most sophisticated, uh, uh, so this is czar of the pricing world, uh, value-based pricing. I mean, um, so generally there is a very subtle difference between, uh, so value-based pricing talks about uh, what is the value provided to the customer versus the cost which went in building that software, right? Uh, it basically tries to compare your software or the value you are providing with the next best option. To, keep, to give, you, give you a very simple option, so let's go back in the days when people used to do stuff like typing, right? Probably they are, I've employed five people, uh, their salaries run into $500,000, right? And uh, there's this other company who built a software uh, for $50,000 and has about $10,000 annual maintenance fee, right? So now their cost is about $60,000 on year one and $10,000 every year. They could literally start pricing uh, anywhere between $60,000 and $500,000. And they'll still be wiping off this, like they'll be making value for this customer, right? So that's where the value lies. That hey, I'm giving you this value because your second be best option was sitting at 500K. So what you would wanna price it at, probably 400 Gs, right? The first year you make whatever, 360, and the next year you start making more, right? Um, similarly, this proposition is using, like has been used with uh, all the software companies since inception. I, I would say like Microsoft uh, was one of the first pioneers of that, like when they started pricing their products. Uh, so softwares are generally uh, at anywhere between 90 to 95% margin, uh, all your enterprise agreement and things like that. That's where they start their list price is at, and then it kind of like all the crazy waterfall thing happens with the tiered customers and whatnot. So, so that's a value-based pricing. Um, so again, very important part is to understand, and how do you kind of implement this? Like a lot of times, uh, implementation of value-based pricing is, by under, by, is understood by understanding what are different parameters which are causing different um, Usability or what are or cost of uh, or sorry reason for cost, and then you kind of come up with a perceived value. Uh, again, a sophisticated value-based pricing uh, generally tries to even discriminate between different regions, different segment of customers, and even different features. You know, again, feature discrimination is obviously easy. Um, so that's, that's value is pricing. Let's go and talk about va uh, a price communication. So what I want to do, uh, keeping on topic of Apple today, uh, <laughs> communicating your price is super, super important. Uh, you made a product. I, I kind of started with it uh, early into my talk. Uh, communicating why your price is where it is, is very important. Uh, we, we'll see how what's happening in this and we'll talk about this that's where I start getting less boring and more interactive with you guys so and I hope the technology helps me okay not really um, It's true. It has always been 
a part of Apple's DNA to show me the ilk variants. Well, just like we Nothing's being sent to Apple. It recognizes when you do say it, and from that point, it sends an anonymous Siri ID. So this in order is the launch the command you're looking for. June 5th, of 2017. Of course, that communication is all encrypted. Let's watch it right now. So this is the HomePod. It's a breakthrough home speaker. Typically, Wi-Fi speakers, if they're good quality, are 300 to 500 dollars. A smart speaker might cost you 100 to 200 dollars. So it's not unreasonable for a HomePod to be priced in the range of 400 to 700 dollars. So we're really excited to tell you that HomePod is going to be priced for 349 dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, while he does that, um, a pop quiz for people who are almost sleeping right here. Uh, raise of hand who, uh, who can tell what kind of pricing was that? And clue, it's one of the five we just discussed. Raise, raise the hands, please. You started first, yeah. Uh, penetration. Okay, another guess. Very perception. Value. 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 Skimming. Value. <laughs> All right, so we have a, a good understanding of like value or skimming, like somewhere there, and then there was penetration. Yeah, Apple doesn't do any kind of penetration. Like, they don't care about people actually <laughs> using it, but they do, right? So. <laughs> Uh, a clue was there in, while I was talking about uh, all the pricing types that Apple does skimming all the time. Yeah. This, to me, was value. He was telling a Wi-Fi speaker cost whatever, and then a smart speaker cost 120 bucks, and we are we could have done that over 400 bucks, but I'm giving you that value at 350. I've been an Apple fan, I've uh, owned an Apple iPhone for like 10 years now. I've never seen ever a price announcement by Apple where they are justifying their price. <laughs> so Apple is now feeling the need of communicating value, right? They cannot just skim. That market of voice assistant is very crowded. It's it has big juggernauts out there, right? I'm right there. <laughs> uh, self marketing. Sorry, sorry. So whatever. Uh, but that's what it is, right? For the first time, I see Apple communicating value, and, and that's what it is, what it mean what, what I mean when I say pricing communication. Why it is necessary, right? Uh, people should know. People should care that you care. This is the way to show that you care, right? Let's, let's get into another example of this. <laughs> Pricing communication gone really wrong. Oh, yeah. Who was alive in 2011? <laughs> OK, everybody, right? Nobody here wasn't around there. Who knew Netflix? Everybody. Like, don't need to raise hand. Um, so this happened, right? Uh, what happened, let me tell you just uh, briefly. They used to be $9.99 for both their DVD deliveries and streaming back in the era of 2011. Uh, and what they did was their product managers realized that, hey, people who do DVD, they don't do streaming. And people who do streaming, they don't do DVD. Let me do this. Let me just split it into two, give people DVD for $8. That's $2 per month in your pocket. Let me give streaming to people for eight dollars. That's again two dollars in your pocket. What people read that as this? They are trying to gauge their prices by sixty percent. They read that messaging as, and they never explained it. Right? This is when you go through books. They never explained it. It was sixteen dollars to them for the same service. Right? 
which was at 10 bucks. This is how Wall Street treated them. They were sitting at a high of $43, and they did that, and in no time they were nine bucks. And I'll tell you, after a split, they are close to $200 today. Guess what? They probably fired some of those guys. <laughs> uh, okay, let's, let's do another interactive pop quiz. What could they have done with this to still keep these people? So they had uh, 80,000 people drop rate. That was a whole lot of subscriber out there. 80% uh, uh, loss in their market, uh, sorry, uh, market valuation. What could they have done back then when they, were, when they knew this data? They could have offered a DVD only plan at a lower price point. So that was that. That was DVD only oh, plan. But, but I mean, like they split off the nine ninety nine and then split it there. But they could have offered it even a fraction lower. I feel like because based on the maturity model, like DVD sales were kind of late, mm -hmm. and so just that as a category was kind of getting eliminated in twenty eleven. Very very good thought, right? Yeah. Uh, um, they could have also approached the DVD watchers and the uh, streaming watchers individually and tell them, okay, we realize you're just watching streams, we price you two bucks less because you don't use the DVDs, and yeah. there you go, it's a, it's a great right. offer for you. Any other shot, like that's a very good like, uh, answer to your communicate, communicate, communicate. Any other takers? In my, uh, so, okay, go ahead. I would say like, uh, okay, eight bucks for streaming. If you also want DVD, which is like a diminishing s segment, you can purchase it for $3 more. <laughs> Perfect. That's what I was thinking. Guess what? $8 for DVD only, $8 for streaming. They together look 16. I'm used to both. I don't want to choose. Why do you take that away? Charge 11 bucks mm -hmm. for both. They are not gonna take both. Like if you were already making profit at 10, if you were already, like I didn't show this graph right here, it looks like this. Why do you want to decrease your sales right there? And then probably take away that model. And I'm so happy this happened. Uh, my talk was on October 12th, because I was gonna go only, like my slide was this. I added this segment. Can you guys see it? Like it's very cramped. Hello. October 5th, 2017 happened. Their announcement of price raise was so well communicated. $1 rise, uh, $1 rise increase in price for $10.99 and only my premium. So $10.99 is their most popular multi-user, you know, like my mom and dad and everybody, you can all share, uh, have all the accounts. And then four credit premium. So now they have understood well. And the basic plan still st uh, stays at nine. So they have clearly marked three segments, and they are trying to treat them differently, right? Uh, and with that, the timing of this was amazing. That was right before the second season of Stranger Things. <laughs> <laughs> Two dollars more for Stranger Things? I mean, take five more, man. Are you serious, right? Uh, and they also said, we are gonna use this money to give you more of Stranger Things, right? Not a very good pit, oh, wait, sorry. But more quality pro uh, content. That's where Netflix is going, mm -hmm. you know? Like, I will give you better content just for $2 a month. Are you serious? Yeah, take it. So that's where, that's the price coming in. Guess what happened in three days? Almost 10% jump in stock. That was, that, Price is on 7th, like probably last Friday, a oh, Monday, this Monday. I pulled it today morning, right? So that's where they are at. So that's the value or the strength of good communication. Before wrapping it up, I want to talk that every business person or businessman or anybody doing anything on earth needs to have ethics in it. That kind of goes a long way. Uh, this case kind of occurred earlier this year and it has been happening. Um, don't want to really call out people, but this is just an example of what happened. Um, Mylan was selling EpiPens and uh, they came into like everybody's eyes because they were uh, selling this almost life-saving drug, EpiPen, for some kind of allergies. Uh, and millions of people, I think 29 million 
Americans take it. It's like a pen you maintain in your pocket, and if you are exposed, you couldn't take it. Otherwise, it, it's crazy. You, you gotta go to ER. Their prices for these EpiPens soared from 100 bucks in 2009 to $600, and that's like a monthly refill. That's not like take ones and be done. Uh, that's my that's what I've researched. I might, if I'm wrong, let me know. But that's like your monthly or one shot or something like that. Like that's a one one month dose, um, and that's 600 bucks. They, they have raised it to 600 bucks, and and uh, so there was this whole lawsuit against them. Uh, am I providing you value? Yes. Hell yeah, you, I'm keeping you alive, right? Are you gonna pay 600 bucks? Of course. All your money is gonna go down the drain once you're dead. Is that ethical? It's not. So we, as whatever chair you're sitting, whatever decisions you're making, try to make sure that you don't stop being human. That's where ethics, for me, it, it's, it's prime for me. So um, now let's get into a fun exercise after all that. Uh, beer drinkers in the house. Oh. Awesome. So this is gonna like be popular. I was thinking you know, like some products and whatnot, but uh, I thought like people might know. But beer is something we know. So uh, let let us run through. There are two exercises here, uh, and I'm gonna just do by show of hands, and then gonna really run through of what it kind of means. Um, so uh, I'm trying to launch uh, a new uh, Mexican beer. Generally made out of, uh, and this is like made out of blue agave, Mexican spices and whatnot. I'm gonna launch in these three states. Uh, alcohol content, 4.5. Kind of average alcohol content, what we see in the uh, my competition category. And uh, the calorie wise, okay, we did something better, like 95 calories for lager? Is that even possible? I don't know, just made it up. <laughs> <laughs> competition is pricing it at 1.2 per bottle to 1.75 per bottle. Um, yeah. So, as a pricing manager myself, I'm gonna try to come at the right price in front of you guys, right? So, uh, raise of hands who drink beer. Uh, yeah, hand exercise, man, please. Uh, a lot of counting for me. Uh, everybody. So, everybody who just raised hands, uh, Raise your hands if you are interested, or if you have tried any of the Mexican beer, Mexican beer, and would be interested in trying this product. So I see a drop out of only ten percent. Right? Uh, it's easy to say that we are all in California, right? Now, right? Okay. <laughs> awesome. That would helps. Uh, out of which. Um, who all really care about that 95 calorie? Raise your hands. <laughs> I mean, we are actually down to like 20%, uh, like about 10 people. Probably not a big, like if there is a no, like it doesn't mean that they don't care. It's like they'll drink it also. I mean, I'll take a low calorie. So you gotta understand what you're asking and what it kind of results. Right? Uh, who's big on like only 4.5% of alcohol, like, or you want real strong? Like, so let's, let me frame this. Who wants more alcohol percent than 4.5? I think 4.5 is less. Okay, 20%, right? So that's a very strong one. So now, for people who did, who like 95 calories, <coughs> like uh, where California we all are, sorry. And basically 95 calories and drinking Mexican beer, uh, given this competition pricing, uh, how many of you would want to pay one dollar? So out of ten people, one, two, three, four, five, and there are more hands than there were, like it's a dollar. So. <laughs> are you kidding me? Yeah, right, probably more than my segment, right? A uh, dollar twenty-five. Okay, almost the size of my 95 calorie segment. It's about 12 people. A uh, dollar fifty. Eighty hmm, 
percent of that segment. It's pretty good. Dollar seventy-five. <laughs> okay, so we, we see some dogmas, right? Uh, so what I did was first understand the entire segment. So this was a segmentation and the pricing exercise, uh, and uh, then basically coming up to right price. So first of all, who are beer drinkers and who have who like Mexican beers? Obviously, easy to understand how I came to, did this. The segmentation, right? Uh, I came to a conclusion that this is very appealing piece, which I'm bringing for similar kind of products, right? If you you saw through the survey, that's an appealing piece, and that can attract a lot of people. Now, when I ask a dollar for this, it's a bargain for people who care or don't care. Should I price it at a dollar because I see ton of people interested? I mean, the answer could be, it's always maybe. Why this maybe? If my supply chain can support this, like, uh, say 20% people loved it uh, among a population of 100, and that kind of translates to, I don't know, like 100 million bottles per month, can my supply chain even support that? Can I even reach those people? Mm. If the answer is no, that's not the right price. I don't want that many people. I would only sacrifice my margin if I can satisfy that market. Dollar twenty-five and dollar fifty almost gave me a uh, hundred percent of the segment, and almost like a ninety or eighty-five percent of the segment. Right? If I run my math, if my cost is sitting at fifty cents for this bottle, which I did hide, I'm making more profit at dollar fifty, serving only eighty percent of my population, than a dollar twenty-five, uh, which gives me entire tan and putting pressure on my supply chain. <coughs> what if there is winter and people don't drink beer? That's California, they don't drink beer, it's, it's my country, I hear. And now I'm from Texas, like it's all beer out there. So, yeah, so that's, that's kind of like a model. Go ahead, you had a question? No. Okay, so a real quick similar ex exercise for craft beer. Um, actually, do you want to do this? Like we kind of get it, like this was a, a deeper segmentation for craft beer. Uh, I see like we are really deep into it, like the timing like we are about an hour. So what I'm going to do is uh, going to just go into Q&A. Um, it was a similar exercise, so yeah. So go ahead. Well, actually I'm curious for the last exercise because don't you have to also take into consideration the fact that most everybody's going to be getting beer from a reseller and therefore you have to take into consideration what the markup is, whether it's a grocery store or a bar, which are two Correct. different use cases. In this yeah, case. yeah, so this, this kind of talks so you can't about... you control how much they're going to be getting it for when they do get it at some level. Per perfect. So the previous exercise is a lot about cost plus and competitor stacking. This is about close to skimming and value. That's where this exercise takes you. Um, like, hey, do I really want to address a very small segment of the market who, who understands, who even understands the definition of American India Paleo? Like, that's a lot of words. That's a lot of like words to chew, right? I'm going to drink that thing, right? And then, uh, I don't know, like kick up orange spices and ginger in my beer? I mean, that's Moscow Mule with Blue Moon? What is that thing? And so that's, that's, a whole different, that's a whole different exercise. We, are, we won't be talking as many books and numbers as value, value, value right. there. But so you'd have like, we're talking about like getting more shelf space from grocery stores because it's more, or like the grocery store can get more margin themselves. They can get more money themselves off selling. Number of bars per tabs also and bars, yeah. yeah, things like that. Okay, yeah, sure. Open and, opening the floor for everything, sir. Yes, uh, I have a question. If you consider the Kindle uh -huh. uh, and the pricing of books on Kindle, if I consider price equal cost plus margin, obviously the price should be lower. If I consider the price is based on the value, it should be higher because I've got the book right now, I can make you know notes and things like and share. So how Amazon came to uh, so, the So here's the thing, uh, there's something which I forgot to announce earlier, is uh, legally, if I don't want to lose my job tomorrow morning, I cannot talk about anything. Okay. So anything Amazon. which I talk had nothing to do with current pricing strategy of Amazon or anything legally down there. Okay. <laughs> so I'm good. Hey, here is this part. Let's talk about Apple and the iBook. So the idea is... <laughs> <laughs> 
I love that. <laughs> so how do you make the pricing of uh, an electronic book, knowing that cost plus margin means price is lower, but value-based pricing means the price is higher? Yeah, even skimming, right? So that's where a couple of things you start by thinking, what, what is, so Apple has always done skimming, like according to me, uh, where you, shoot, you put a, a value price for the first time. Again, this is where the exact, what I was telling, you start with an initial price, you launch, you collect the data on how it's performing, spend money on your brand and premium and placement, let's see if it freaking sticks, and if it does, voila, same price. If it doesn't stick, oh my God, that was such a failure, voila, right? So if you had difficulty pushing out your stuff out of your supply chain and your, your warehouses, you know what to do, scound them, right? So that's, so that's where there is no right answer. The right price is where, which makes you uncomfortable. The right price is where, which makes your customers a little uncomfortable as well. When you are doing skimming and, and uh, value, penetration and all has a different mindset. Go ahead. Uh, how do you analyze like the pre-order sales, like a like a sell, uh, sell me a mobile phone, right? Price three forty nine. They have like a flash sale. Correct. You correct. get all the all the orders in, and then go back to the supplier and get the cost of like a Tesla Model Three, like a thousand dollars deposit for a thirty five thousand yeah. dollars car. So 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 basically the Kickstarter model, right? Yeah. Billions of Kickstarters out there who are trying to get some <coughs> money uh, to. So what I call that is the fund me model, and I'll give you that initial discount. As uh, a product manager for that, I would figure, I would wanna know or understand where would my price value would be at launch, right? And now, what am I doing is, <coughs> hey, I wanna make sure that, so if I don't receive the funds, I might not be able to launch my product, so let's do this. Uh, let's do an understanding of what my cost would be at an average. <coughs> Add a little bit of markup to make sure that I cover logistics, people reach, blah, blah, whatnot, and still make a decent level profit. So it is, it'll be anywhere between, uh, across between your cost plus pricing and value. So you want to always say that, hey, my price is 100 bucks, but guess what? I'm selling you at like 79.99 as a, a initial offering. Right, you're getting 20%, 25%. So what you did is just made sure that you didn't discount it heavily to like, get their funds. You're not dying to get their funds. You're gonna give a value product. If you had started with a $50 and you're telling them you're gonna sell it for 100 bucks, it'll never sell it for 100 bucks even when you have a, a successful launch. It has to take a miracle to get there. So you wanna understand like the right balance, right? Uh, another thing which would help is like see the alternative solutions, always. Batna, it's called Best Alternative Solutions. Yeah. If you're a startup, how are you justifying penetration pricing to your investors if your penetration lasts <coughs> eight years sometimes, as we've seen with some companies in the Bay Area? Uh, I mean, I have never been at a startup, but then I've s tracked a lot of them, right? Sorry for that answer. Um, justifying that if, so, so there is a model, um, uh, which I'll tell you is uh, customer uh, lifetime value. Have you heard of that? So customer lifetime value, if for people who haven't heard of it, is basically trying to get an estimate of how long a customer sticks to your platform, so customer lifetime on the platform, and the, do the average dollar you can extract from that customer on your platform. Uh, again, for startups, they do all sorts of projections that I can extract more because we are sitting at like a dollar now, we are gonna raise prices and we are not gonna lose that option. So with your investor, there is always that pull and push, but then that's the valuation model you follow. Uh, a very good story again, uh, in 2013 uh, when I was taking uh, marketing at UT, I was given Netflix uh, paper, right? Uh, the stocks were back up again. They were sitting at 63. They had gained their 80,000 subscriber, and they were just sitting right there. Uh, and it seemed like a turnaround story already. 
uh, working on that case, uh, I was an engineer and my partner was a lawyer. Uh, we came up with a stock valuation with that model which we talked about at $253 before the split. We looked at each other and we were like, uh, if, if you're going to get an A, we should buy stocks today. <laughs> or I think we're getting a C. So guess what we did? We actually fudged our numbers and got a like $120 valuation for the company. It actually went way past here in bucks in less than two years, right? And we know it's part of the FANG terminology. It takes a lot to be part of the big five, six, right? So, so that's where I'm saying like that's the best model I try to do the valuation and the pricing. Like it's about the customer lifetime value and their adoption and their sticking. Uh, I'll start from this. Okay, I missed you. I'll do this. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I, having assessed the market, I, I think I can authoritatively say that we're creating a new market with our product. Uh -huh. Now, if we come in, because it's hard to benchmark it against other people, if we come in at a certain level <clears throat> on the basis that we're an explicit product, but on the other hand, that allows people who come behind us, who I think will want to because it's a new market, to undercut us. Uh, at what point should we be defensive about the way we price and say, well, we can anticipate people coming who will want to undercut who we can lower our price? You know, uh, so so I one line answer, in a way. I understand so a lot of times I have the for startups what has always stuck and made them successful, especially their, if their pricing has to stick, is keep innovating. Make that customer delight experience because people who have already gotten on your platform, who understands that you understand them better yeah. than your competitors, they will stick around. Okay. They will. Um, and then if you still think that, okay, people are able to innovate better than you, they are able to like, uh, you know, delight their customer better, that's when you take the pricing strategy, right? So always product strategy first. I, I brought pricing here because it's product school. We have, I've seen a ton of awesome speakers here about product and how to think about it. Uh, but then I wanted to bring the second layer of thought yeah. to the table. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, yes? We, we have time only for two more questions, okay? Oh. Sorry. Okay. Um, can you also shed some insights into pricing for B2P products? Okay. That's literally two, two more talks. That's great. Like that's my forte actually. Like that's my like biggest area. Like if I can talk, that's why I probably cho chose more B2C and a generic pricing because I would be talking about more. Uh, I'll take you. Go ahead. Yeah. So how do you define the price for the product that has a very high base cost but very low variable cost? So for example, for the beer is very like, straightforward, we can just like 20% mark up because we know there may be $8 per bottle. But how about for like Netflix? Maybe you have a very huge fixed cost, but maybe the variable cost is pretty, pretty low. So how do you like, decide the price? Yeah, so this, this basically is a very good question, especially for software industry and even a little bit of uh, consumer electronics and things like that what we make. is. Uh, even before you start making a product, there's this exercise, what I like to do is cost of implementation versus value possibly paid in the market. Right? You always start thinking about uh, value of your product. So run a value-based analysis of your per unit, uh, and then do a, a, an analysis of your projected uh, percentage market you can gain. So basically this analysis, if you can run with a 90% confidence to get a number, then you do another um, thing, which is called your R&D cost. The least number of people in terms of your R&D production, marketing, and advertising. What is the, the cost you can come up with, you know, to get this product in the market, right? So, f so that's basically you're comparing two type of costs. Like, so you can assume you on the left side with all the value and projected <coughs> two-year sale. Uh, I mean, you always want to run two or three years um, as a startup. Uh, also, another good thing to see is what is the product life cycle of your product you're in. If you're in a phone business, it's a two-year life cycle. If you don't recoup your money in two years, hey, bad news. I think the industry is going to move faster than you, your product can. Software depends on what your, your offering is. So two-year revenue rate versus two-year run rate uh, to actually get to MVP and some kind of maturity, 
you stack that against each other. If there, if if you see there's a big delta, you talk to people. Are you, you see this? Like, okay, no, that's not happening, right? I'll take more. All right, right, let's say one more. One more. <laughs> one more. Yeah. yeah no, so the exa fine. examples you use in your presentation are kind of Apple and Netflix. They're very large companies. They have a lot of price rigidity, and, and they set the price, and they can't change it for a very long period of time. But for smaller companies, a little bit more nimble and flexible, and they're just starting out, as we heard an example. Um, they have a more flexibility to set the price and adjust the price and kind of test different price points. Do you have particularly like any strong thoughts on the, the frequency or the, the timing of, kind of price changes and how often can you do it and, and stay credible? Yeah, so very, very good question. I think I uh, could have uh, covered myself in the presentation, but even though you're a startup, I do not uh, recommend changing your pricing a lot. There could be one or two like coupon discount marketing programs because that shows weakness in the value you communicated. It shows weakness in the leadership and it shows like basically weakness all throughout. So you say don't go Groupon? Don't go Groupon. <laughs> Seriously. All right, thanks guys. Uh, great audience.